all around you, there are people that are what I like to call the unsung heroes of the faith. They are the people who have heard the message that have gone out and didn't wait for you know the organization or the skills or the people or the planning or the committees or anything else to do the work of what God has shown them to do. But rather they've gone out and lived and make a part of their life the things Jesus said to do. We have a friend. Well, before I get to that, I should comment on this. I know you're probably wondering what this is. Of course, you probably couldn't have seen it until I picked it up, but this is my green bean. <laughs> Not Mr. Green Jeans, <laughs> although somehow it seems to fit around here lately. But this is my first green bean, and I'm getting ready to offer it back unto the Lord. I do that just because it's one of those things I enjoy. It's not because I employ some messianic thing or some, you know, first fruits offering, but, you know, it's something that God and I have chosen to make a part of our life together. It's something that Him and I enjoy personally, that I take, you know, my first fruits offering, the first of whatever it is that's been the increase in my life, and I try, I don't say I always do, but I try to offer it back unto Him. And so I'll probably take this green bean, you know, and I'll say just a minor prayer and it's like God thank you you know plant it <laughs> you know back in where it grew and it's just my way of celebrating God in what he has done in my life for giving me this green bean you know and the plant that it grew out of I have to admit I am surprised at the the green bean it grew from because it was like little tiny mini trees that had them hanging down like this and I was like huh so that's how they grow I mean don't get me wrong, I've seen lots of plants over my lifetime, you know, grow when I was a kid. And I lived in Norco and we had farmland, you know, in Mira Loma, there was cows and dairy, you know, and I grew up with horses and chickens and, you know, all the other things. But some things, you know, you just forget or along the way if you live in the city or you tend to be more, more, well, city folk than country folk. But when I lived in Oregon, you know, you learned country real fast. I mean, I've been out in the fields where, you know, Hey, I know what a spud is, because <laughs> I work with spud sellers. <laughs> Believe me, I've been on a picker, <laughs> and I've been on a sorter, <laughs> and I've driven, you know, the trucks. So, you know, been there, done that. <laughs> wow, was that interesting. A lot of work, <laughs> you know, and I had to do it. As a matter of fact, I think I used that money to go to Israel. But the point being is that I offer this back to the Lord my God, you know, because I'm thankful, and then I, I always like to look at it and kind of enjoy the goodness of the Lord and what He's done, you know, and how He's created these things and made them, you know, that I can enjoy them and eat them, you know, but this one I give back to God just because that's what I do. It's just a habit more than a tradition. It's more of a enjoyment than it is of a dogma or doctrine. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they think, oh, well, if you're Jewish, you do that. Well, if you're Christian, you don't. If you do this, you do that. You know, you're under the law or you're under grace or whatever. No, you do what you do because you enjoy it. And that's what brings me to my point today. The unsung heroes of the faith are those people that are doing those things that God has said to do because they enjoy it. Not because they're employed by God, but because they enjoy their God. And that's something that brings me to this person I know that I wanted to bless today, you know, and to cast out the name out there so that you could pray a blessing upon her because she's so impressed me with her life that I stand in awe. I mean, I've been a Christian gosh 39 years you know and there's some people that I stand in awe of you know like lately and this one pastor you know that I'm kind of like sitting at his feet <laughs> go figure you know but you know I kind of stand in awe of you know kind of like you know there are different people that have kind of really impressed me you know and sometimes it's either by their teaching or by their work in the ministry or you know whatever it may be something of their nature that God has created in them puts me in awe of them at times, you know, and different people, different places, different things, you know, it's not one person has it all, but, you know, I see them as an example of a believer for me, you know, in some area, never all together, but this one person I'm very fascinated by, you know, it's like, she's amazing to me in what God has used her to inspire me with, and that's her ministry, you know, her, she doesn't think of it as a ministry, but her name's Chloe, it's a girlfriend of my wife's, and she amazes me in what she does, just because she does it. You know, she's kind of a, my wife met her a long time ago when she was working at this, you know, kind of, you know, company here in, well, anyways, a company. And um, she 
was hired on as a receptionist, and she did her job, and they used her in her capacity to the full skills that she was able to do. And then when they came about to downsizing, and they were going to eliminate a lot of people because of the expense of trying to pay for their insurance and their retirement and their benefits and everything else, instead of providing for those faithful employees that worked for them, they were cutting all out the old wood, bringing in the new so they could hire new employees, because it's a business technique. You cut your overhead by cutting out the old wood and putting in the new. It's kind of like an immoral, unethical business decision, but businesses aren't Christian, lest you forget. Business is about business. And while I applauded their decision as far as a business practicality was concerned, oh, I could easily say they were immoral and unethical in what they treated her and how they treated her, and how they wanted to move her into another position and try to train her in some way that she was not capable of doing. And so they eventually let her go. And when they let her go, she was kind of like caught short. She was without income. She didn't have the ability to immediately find work. And it was like, wow. And we were concerned for her because she was someone that we had gotten to know. And so we visited, and she still did her thing. One of her things that I found out that she does was she decided to make soup. She made a big bowl of soup, like big cauldrons or something, and passed it out to people. She didn't just make it for herself, because she's kind of a bigger woman, but she made it for lots of people, kind of like, abodanza, come on over. And she would pass it out to people she knew. And I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. And it was kind of neat. My wife stayed in touch with her, and they were friends. And they would text back and forth. Amazing, the world of text, isn't it? And they would visit. But when we were living in the same apartment complex, my wife and her would go swimming. Every day they would go swimming in the summer. And they would swim, I imagine, pretty slow, but back and forth in the pool, and that was their exercise. And they got a chance to talk and chit-chat like women do. But the thing that amazed me about her was that she would see someone that was begging on the street. She would feel convicted by it. Oh, she didn't talk much about her Christianity. As a matter of fact, I don't even know what church she goes to, but I know she goes to a church at times. I don't even know fully what her faith is completely, but I know that I've talked to her a little bit, not about the Lord, but about other things. And I know that she's faithful to what God has revealed to her. And so I've been kind of amazed at hearing her testimony. I've been amazed by what the news is about her, about what her reputation is, about who she is as far as what everyone else sees. Because, you see, being a bigger person, she has sisters that are even bigger than she is, and she goes over and helps them out. Some of them have serious health issues, and so she takes care of them. Even when she wasn't working, she would go over and take care of them, or her daughter or someone else. She would use what little money she had and money she didn't have to help them out. And then when she was making food, she would go out of her way to help others. And she was constantly doing that, and I was always dumbfounded because she never quite got convicted. She never got out of funds. God always provided in some way for her. But the amazing thing to me was that as she went through her life and it looked like things were going to fall apart, God would rescue her. And so when it looked like she was out of funds and going to have to move, God provided her a job. And she found a job with this company, and the people hired her. So praise the Lord, I was happy. I felt more comfortable about her, and I felt like I didn't need to worry. And so as she had this job, she had fellow workers. They worked in some, I'm not even sure what it was, but apparently one of the workers, being Mexican, or if you don't like me saying Mexican, hey, it's your problem, not mine. Latino, Mexican, whatever, it doesn't matter. Argentinian, Peruvian, Ecuadorian, come on, give me a break. I grew up in Southern Cal, so it's a Mexican. But anyways, Mexican, Latino, American, they were of this family that all owned the business and worked the business. And so one of the fellow workers, she saw a need to choose. So she saw when she was visiting one of the used store places, some shoes that she thought he would like. So she went and bought the shoes that were really industrial grade for him. And so she bought the shoes and gave them to him, and bought some clothes and gave them to him, and did those kind of things. And her bosses noticed that. And so 
you know, she went about her business and she was always taking her, you know, sisters and people and stuff, you know, different things and doing things. So, you know, she would sometimes even get into challenges where she'd, you know, borrow money and then pay it back. You know, she always paid back her money. She always paid her debts. So, you know, she would use her car, which was pretty banged up, you know, car, you know, to do the work of what she was doing. And then her car blew up. Well, you know, by that time, it was like, wow, that's a big deal. You know, I know, because I had, we had a junker. We were driving our junker forever until we got the car we got now. And, uh, and I love that junker. <laughs> it's gone. But her car blew up, and so it was like, oh, no, what's going to happen? Well, her bosses went out and bought her a brand new car. Her bosses had seen her lifestyle, had seen what she had done, had watched her, had been aware that she was such a faithful and good employee and such a heart of gold, they bought her a car. Now, I don't know about your bosses. My bosses never did that for me. I never seen anybody do that. I was dumbfounded. As a matter of fact, I was thoroughly amazed. And she got a new car and she drove it over and she's all excited, you know, and it's like, wow, boy. And you know, I just kinda like have watched over the over this time period how God has blessed her, even though at times, you know, you would think, Oh my god, how are they gonna make it or how's she gonna make it? God took care of her and then abundantly blessed her out of her mind in ways she would not have thought of or I would have thought of even. And so don't be surprised, you know, when you see around you, you know, one moment a person that you think of as less or more or whatever, you know, and you mistake who they are for what they really have become. Because she would go out of her way, you know, to find people that were like begging for for food, you know, on the street, you know, and you'd say, oh, well, they're crooks, you know. Well, she would take them to a McDonald's and, you know, have a burger. She'd buy them a meal. You know, not not just, you know, give them some money, but she would say, hey, I'll take you over, you know, and she would do that. Now, that's not safe for women, but she would do it, you know, and of course, there are other things that she did that I don't tell you about because I want her to have all her blessings, but the point being is that there are unsung heroes all around you doing the work of the ministry, which is what we are all called to do. It's not about what I'm doing, being in front of the camera, you know, and saying all these wonderful things and teaching and sharing and relating the Word of God. But it's about putting into practice those things that you hear from the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit has placed within front of your eyes the very ministry and administration, the Word of God, to the practicalities of life with people around you that are suffering and hurting and needing a hug or needing, you know, a, a shirt or some clothing or some food. And that's the one thing that she did. She provided clothing, shoes, food, those things that are necessities of life that her reputation is such that she now has, in my mind's eye, wow, the administration of what the grace of God should be in all of our lives. I would stand up in heaven and declare, you know, her faithfulness and her righteousness before all the angels in heaven. Because I'm just thoroughly amazed. I am dumbfounded by just watching and hearing of the things that she has done. And she doesn't know that. She doesn't know that I, I watch from afar or I know or I pray for her. She doesn't know anything much about me. You know, she knows my wife and they text and, you know, we don't talk much. You know, and once in a while, you know, if I cook some big recipe, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and send it to her and blow her mind that I know how to cook, you know. <laughs> you know, or like growing these uh, veggies, you know, I'll send her over some veggies and she'll, she'll write us or text us, you know, tell us about some deal at some, you know, cheap store because poor minister to poor and needy to need and, you know, she's not exactly the most wealthy person in the world and believe me, my wife and I, <laughs> We're down there, you know. We're, we're at the bottom. You know, we're not looking up at the barrel and saying, you know, like, oh wow, look at the barrel over there. No, we're looking up at the bottom of the barrel and going, ooh, you know, it's getting tough, you know, and rough out there. But that's the way it is. And so, I admire and I look at, you know, different people's lives. And you know, Chloe is one of those people that God has anointed and appointed to be a witness and a testimony in these gathering darkening times when we see you know, the world getting colder in some ways. There's always someone around you that's going to be a heart of gold and have the very nature of God manifested in them that no matter what comes, they'll continue to do the work of the ministry which is what we should be doing. Feeding those who are hungry clothing those who are naked, providing shoes even for the very feet of those who may have need. And we
we won't see those needs unless we look for them, unless we go to them, unless we leave the 99 that are fat and sassy and brassy, you know, back in the church, you know, where we're at, and go to the ones that are probably there at our work or on the street or somewhere around us that you know you pass by and you see them somewhere at some time, that you could go to them and touch them in their need. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For in this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. In and of itself, when I look at the ministry of Jesus, I always see him ministering to people. People. Not masses, but people. Individuals. One-on-one. -on -one. Singularity of purpose often determines quality of service. Remember that. Think about that for a minute. Singularity of purpose often determines quality of service. In other words, when I was, quote unquote, a manager at McDonald's, I taught people, you know, in customer service, because management in McDonald's, when I was going through it, was one of the number one management training programs in the world besides Carnegie. And it was one of the things that, you know, young people coming up through the ranks would learn how to deal effectively in management if you went through McDonald's management training program. And they had a quality one, I don't know what they have now, but, you know, at the time that I was growing up, you know, 30 some 40 whatever years ago and a long time ago but um, it was one of the management training programs in the world you know, leading because that's what they were geared towards in our society as you know was back then because it's changed a lot now but one of the things that we were told was to focus in on the person the one in front of you is the most important person and I would train my people you know, that were, I was a training coordinator for McDonald's. I would train my people that you were the most important person was the person right in front of you. You don't care about the burgers behind you. The, you know, we used to have what were called a, a 1020 throw lay or whatever. You know, you lay down the burgers on the grill, you know, and then as soon as they flipped them over, you throw more down. And, you know, you could hear that from the counter. So a lot of times people would, you know, kind of turn their, you know, hear what was being said and turn and try to do multiple things at multiple times. You know, we call it multitasking right now. No, I train the opposite. That person in front of you with their money, with their order, with their eye contact is the most important person in your life and you stay right there until you have that person completely fulfilled with all that they want and that they have enjoyed the experience of coming to your cash register, your McDonald's because it's your reputation that you're putting out there as well as the entire corporation behind you which is McDonald's. And I made every one of those people that worked with me feel that way. And when they did, they recognized that they were something to be proud of, that they were filled with this, wow, this perspective of looking at, wow, that person's important. I'm going to make sure they get to order, and they get it quick, and they get it done, and they, they, they come back. And that was the point of what we were doing and why we did it. Customers came back to the same person. And they began to get, you know, looking for, you know, they would go, I would have a line sometimes, you know, in, you know, five people deep, you know, that somebody else wouldn't even have a customer because they enjoyed whoever they were talking to. And that was the point of the people that I trained as opposed to some of the other trainees and people that were, you know, had bad attitudes. They wanted to go to where they were appreciated. They wanted to go where their perspective was treated with respect and that they got their order, but they also got an enjoyable experience of being there. Someone was genuinely glad to see them, or at least it appeared so. And I tried to train people to be so. And that's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to you know, mope around because, oh, I'm doing the will of God. <laughs> you know, whining about what we don't have. You know, I mean, I have lots of reasons to 
complain. Chloe, more than anyone else I know, has every reason to be down and out. Often, many times a day, with just the different things that come her way. And she's not. And she's not the biggest saint in the world. She doesn't have, you know, the greatest biblical knowledge. But she's got the personality that gives of what she's got and gets from what God gives. And that's the point of why we do what we do. We get from God what we're able to give. You can't give more than you got. That's the truth. But you can give to the very last amount that you have, and you'll find that God will bring the increase when you give the last that you have. Because even with Elijah, the woman had to give the bottom of the barrel, the last of her food that she was going to give, you know, even to her own son, she gave it to the prophet instead. And God spared her and took care of her because she was willing to do the will of God. And that's what sometimes we forget because we give out of our abundance and we don't think much about it. But if we give out of our desperate need, then we give back to God the ability to bless us with even more so because he knows he can trust us with his abundance as opposed to our insufficiency. Because our sufficiency comes from God and it is of him that we relate all that we have and all that we are. And if we choose to be any other way, then we're not doing what Jesus said, which Jesus was the epitome of the person who had a need of everything. Foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but nowhere is the Son of Man to lay his head. He had no retirement accounts. He had no planning for the future. He didn't sit down and take out his PDA and say, okay, well, you know, if I got time this week, I think I'll make it. Oh, I'm sorry, I got an appointment. You know, I'm scheduled to go over to the gathering, so I can't make it this week. He stopped what he was doing and stayed where he was at. As a matter of fact, even his own friends and family sometimes chastised him for not being where they wanted him to be. One of the women that said, hey, Lord, you know, if you'd have been here, if you would have came, my brother would not have died. He would have been alive. And Jesus was like, well, that's true, but watch and see what I will do. And he raised him from the dead. With God, you don't got to get, you know, all wrapped up into what you get caught up into. If anything, you got to give to God what you got, and God will give to you a better perspective of the reality of focusing in on the importance of the individual and the person that's in front of you right now. You, the number one person that's important to God. So that God could use you, God could choose you, God could take you to a place you never dreamed imaginable. And that's the reality of living your day by day existence with God. Choosing to be not yourself, but at those moments when the Holy Spirit comes and push, splashes you with oh my gosh, pouring out just a gusher, a gusher, you know, that you drill deep into your soul and you pull from inside your holy, inside your soul the very nature of God himself by way of the Holy Spirit touching other people's lives. You go, oh, wow, I had not known that God was in this. I had not known that God was doing this. Little did I know that God was in this place. And that's what Jacob did too. Jacob found that in the places where he didn't think was ministry, was actually the ministration of God himself. And we all need to look around again, more than once, more than twice, sometimes ask God to open our eyes to the very people around us that are perishing and passing away, because that's your ministry today, to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. But more than that, and more than the gospel, more than these things that we make so religious, sometimes it's just giving them something to eat giving them something to drink, giving them something to wear. And I'm sure you can do that. Each and every one of us have a little more than we need.